Okay, so we've already talked uh, quite a bit like about natural selection, about Darwin, like kind of how he came up with his ideas and all that stuff. I want to kind of delve in today uh, into a little bit more of the nitty gritty of uh, how we know this is really happening. Okay, is there, is there evidence for evolutionary change? And I think that hopefully you're already starting to grasp that there is lots of evidence, um, especially like after we watch the videos in class, um, it should hopefully be fairly obvious to you like how this stuff really works. Um, but let's dive in a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about a couple of new concepts today as we go. Um, shouldn't take us too long. So yeah, like I said, the evidence, it's really all around us. And I know you guys have probably heard the joke that you know, if uh, there was a nuclear war or something like that, the only thing that would survive would be the cockroaches. Right? And it's kind of funny because you know, if you've ever had cockroaches before in your house, you know just how hard they are to kill. Like you can try and stomp on them, they get away, they hide, you, you step on them and they get right back up and laugh at you and keep right on going. They eat virtually anything. I had a friend who kept cockroaches for a while. Why, I have no idea. But he would feed them, literally feed them bits and pieces from the bottom of his pizza box where the oil had soaked through and they would eat the cardboard. They didn't care. Like, so, well, it is kind of a joke that, you know, if there was a nuclear holocaust, the only thing left would be the cockroaches. Um, it is also true that little buggers are tough, right? Um, so to understand how like evolution works and how natural selection works, uh, you kind of have to understand that, you know, there's characteristics in a population. And some cockroaches are, of course, uh, better suited to certain environments than other cockroaches. And it comes into particular stark contrast when we do things like putting pesticides out, like when you spray your house to try and kill the cockroaches. Um, this is a measurable thing. Right? And we have seen cockroaches developing a greater and greater resistance to our insecticides. Right? Let's say you spray your house to try and kill the cockroaches. But there's a couple that survive because they're just a little bit already. There's already a variation in the population. They're just a little bit more resistant to the poison that you put out. Okay? And they didn't get quite enough to die from it. And so they reproduce like these things do, and you get hundreds more in short order, and they're right back again. Now all the ones that survived the first wave of insecticide are gonna have the same resistance genes that the, the ones that survived it originally did, right? You hit them again. This time you use like a double dose, even stronger stuff. And if there's one or two that manage to not die from this stuff, like they have genetic variation that allows them to survive it, you keep pushing the population towards greater and greater and greater insecticide resistance. Right? You didn't make the genes. They were already there. It just selected for it. And while this seems like kind of like a benign issue, it's a real problem for farmers. Like we spray our crops for pests. And in the United States, we have had to keep increasing the toxicity of the chemicals we put on the crops. Why? Because of evolved resistance to the pesticides. So the pests keep getting more and more resistant and we keep increasing the toxicity. Well, at some, some, at some point, the stuff we're spraying on the crops is gonna be like really bad for us and we're gonna have to stop doing it. So there's, there's issues, right, um, in, in playing this sort of evolutionary warfare that's really going on um, at the molecular level, like it's a real thing and understanding it helps us to battle things like insects that are evolving resistance and things along those lines. So, um, this isn't actually, it's, it's a very useful theory in and apart from just what it tells us about life on our planet, right? So let's dive in here and look at some of the evidence. Uh, oftentimes I get the question, you know, are there fossils? Oh my goodness, are there fossils? Oh, I love fossils. There are so many fossils. Um, but oftentimes you hear folks ask the question, well, where are the transition fossils? If you've never heard that before, a transition fossil is a fossil that's kind of in between two different groups of organisms. Things that you may, may not quite notice are really closely related. Um, it's got characteristics of both. So first of all, to understand transition fossils and their appearance or their lack thereof, you have to understand Earth is very old, four and a half billion years old. Um, a lot of time has gone by on our planet. So like for, the amount of fossils that we have is kind of surprising considering how difficult it is to fossilize something. 
So if I were to go outside like in the schoolyard here and dig a hole and bury my dog because my dog passed away, right? Could I come back in 100 years and find a dog fossil? How about a million years? Billion years? No. None of those situations would provide us with fossils. And the reason is because you need very specific conditions to make a fossil. Right? If I wanted my dog to become a fossil, well, there'd have to be some luck involved. First of all, it'd have to get buried probably underneath some sediment in the bottom of a shallow ocean, covered up very quickly before anything ate it. Oxygen would have to get cut off to it so the bacteria didn't dissolve the bones and everything else. And then it would need to be buried and not destroyed for, you know, a million years or so. And then we could talk about a fossil forming, right? So uh, we're not going to have fossils of every last thing on this planet. Let's just accept the fact. We're building a picture without, like, a perfect, perfect record. But even so, there is a really good record. And there are some things that we have amazing transition fossils for. For instance, like whales. I know it's kind of a strange thing, but we have all kinds of transition fossils for whales. Okay. Um, so looking back at this, you can see, you can actually trace the evolutionary history of the whale from a thing that looks kind of like a dog and scavenged along the, the edge of the ocean all the way up to the thing that lives in the water. Do you guys know what whales are? Whales are not fish. Whales are mammals, just like us. So it's a bizarre story because mammals come from things, if you go back far enough, that came from the ocean. And then they went back to the ocean. But whales breathe air, just like you do. They don't have gills. Their bone structure, everything about them is very much more similar to you than it is to a fish. It's a real strange story. What's the whale most closely related to on our planet now that we understand genetic sequencing? The whale is most closely related to the hippo. Did you know that? <laughs> and it's not just because it's big. Like genetically, when you line up the DNA, that's, what's, that's its closest relative on land. Isn't that strange? So there are some things that we have phenomenal fossils for, like all the way back to some things that are kind of in-betweeners. But there are some things that we don't, like, for instance, turtles. We ain't got no idea. We do have some idea. But there is a lot of missing fossils for turtles. That seems like a strange thing to point out. And you're probably like, well, who cares? But the point is, is that there are some lineages that we're still trying to sort out. There are other things like whales that we, we know almost for certain, like very, very well. Lots and lots of fossils. Um, so uh, keep that in mind kind of as we're talking here. I want to point out another one here that's pretty unique. Tiktaalik, which we watched the video on the other day. Um, so a lot of the time I get the question, you know, many theories in science, for the most, all theories in science, make predictions about things. Okay, like we can use Newton's theories to predict like how an object will orbit another object. And, and sure enough, lo and behold, it follows those predictions, right? Um, we can use Einstein's theories to make predictions about relativistic effects. And sure enough, your cell phone time syncs up with the satellite time, just like it should, right? So the theory of evolution is a little different because it's a biological theory. So it's not a physical sciences theory. So its predictions are a little bit different. But it certainly can make predictions. And Tiktaalik is a phenomenal example of that. So here's the deal. We know that there is a lineage that if we trace things back, uh, we can get back to things like uh, the, going back from the mammals, uh, going back to reptile ancestors, going back to amphibian ancestors, going back to something that actually lived in the ocean all the way back to the fishes. Okay, the, the, the four limb pattern that we, we exhibit and that other organisms exhibit traces all the way back to fish. It's pretty strange because you look nothing like a fish. But it would stand to reason that if that is really true, which is what all the evidence points to, there ought to be a transition fossil somewhere between fish and amphibians. There ought to be something that's part amphibian and kind of part fish-like. So scientists know the date where this should be in, in, in Earth's record, okay? They know about how long ago it should exist. 
and they know, also know what kind of conditions it should live in, right? Like we're talking like shallow ocean environments. And so they say to themselves, let's find this thing. So knowing what age of rock they need and having a map of the earth and knowing where that particular rock is exposed and then finding that age of rock in a, in a fossilized oceanic shallow environment, they went looking. And sure enough, up in British Columbia, there's a little arrow there, up in the way, way northern Canada, they located Tiktaalik. So they predicted it, they said it ought to be here, and they went and found it. That is a pretty cool prediction, right? And Tiktaalik, when you look at it, um, it, it is very much like part amphibian, kind of part fish. This is, this is the definition of a transition fossil. It's like an in-betweener, right? So it's a pretty cool thing that we are able to find that. Now, we've, we've made other discoveries too, things that have shocked us. For instance, I'll put this guy up here. This is a coelacanth. Uh, we thought these were extinct about 65 million years ago, like with the dinosaurs. Right? Um, there was somebody fishing out here off the coast of Africa here, uh, an old guy in a little fishing village, and he pulled one of these things up in his net. Up until this happened, we had only ever seen them in fossils. And he didn't know what it was. He wasn't going to eat it. He wasn't sure if it was even edible. He'd never seen one before. And uh, eventually, the got, word got back to a university, and some paleontologists ended up there because the biologists weren't even really sure what it was. And they saw that this perfectly resembles the fossil that we have. So sometimes some amazing discoveries happen. Like you've got a fossil of something, which is well known, and then all of a sudden we find the same thing still living deep in the ocean where we haven't looked yet. It's kind of interesting. But this is interesting for another reason, because this is a lobe-finned fish. If you look close at its fins, I want you to see this front fin here. Okay. Notice that it probably doesn't look like any fish you've ever eaten before. It's not just a little flipper-looking fin. It actually has kind of a little arm shoulder joint and it can rotate that fin around in different directions. In fact, this fish is related to the ancient fishes that first walked out onto land. Think, see how it could rotate that shoulder joint? If you looked inside that, that fin right there, you would see bone structure that's really similar to your bone structure. It's weird. And we do, yes, we do still have fish today that can walk on land. Did you know that? We have fish today like the lungfish that can crawl out of the water, breathe air with their lungs, and crawl to another puddle if, if their puddle dries up. So <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of evidence that this is what really happened. And finding the living fish is just that much more the icing on the cake. So let's look at bone structures here a little bit. These are called homologous structures. Okay? The most famous example of this is uh, vertebrate uh, arm or leg bones. So on the test, I can guarantee you, since I wrote it, you're gonna see a question about homologous structures and it will have to do with bones because this is the quintessential example of this. Okay, Take a look at these three things. They look not at all similar on the outside, do they? Talking about a bird wing, a crocodile leg, and a whale leg or a whale flipper, okay? They have vastly different uses. The whale swims with that thing. The crocodile walks in across the ground and the bird flies. Those couldn't be more different. But if you look on the inside, there is a homology, a similarity, and that tells us that they have a common origin. Even though they're very different on the outside, they have a very common origin. They've just diverged through time, like to adapt to different circumstances. But look at the bones, they line up. The radius and the ulna, yeah, they're short and fat in the, in the whale, and the crocodile's a bit longer, and the bird is much thinner and, and more uh, fragile looking. Right? But even down to the phalanges, the fingers, like they're strikingly similar. You'll find this in virtually any vertebrate that you look, look for. That's because we're all related, okay? All right, that's a homologous structure. Let's compare that with the other one, because you're going to have to know the difference. The other one is called an analogous structure. Okay. An analogous structure has a similar function, but doesn't have a common origin. So check it out. 
back in the day, way back in the day, like Aristotle in times, people used to think that bats and butterflies should be classified in the same group. Today you know that's nonsense, right? Like I hope you know that's nonsense. And the lack of any homologous structures should be good evidence of that. What does a bat have inside of its wings? It's got bones. The butterfly, its wings are made out of chitin. There, there's not even the same, <laughs> the same proteins that are making up the two things. Right? We could sequence their DNA. They couldn't be more different. Do they both fly? Yeah, but that does not mean that they're closely related. So what, what an analogous structure sometimes is, is an example of something we call convergent evolution, where organisms from different groups that are not related, like those big birds Darwin was looking at, they converge on the same characteristic because their environment is similar, the air, okay? So this is an analogous structure. Okay, let's talk about another type of structure. These are kind of, some of my favorites because they're kind of fun. They're called vestigial structures. So I like to kind of refer to these as the evolutionary leftovers. This is the junk that's left behind, but it's still there. So let's look at a few of these. Uh, we can look at snakes. Some snakes have leg bones inside their bodies. And the tips of their leg bones, these little spurs, stick out on the outside. I think the ball python is one if you've ever seen a ball python. On the inside, there's leg bones. What purpose do leg bones have on a snake? None, right? Snakes don't run around on their legs. It's a leftover because their ancient ancestors were reptiles that had four legs. So it's a leftover, okay? Now don't, don't cut open any old snake and go, hey, Hambling said there'd be legs in here. Not all snakes still have this, some snakes do. Uh, we can look at whales. Whales have some really unique, weird ones. Uh, for instance, a whale has a pelvic bone. It's got a pelvic girdle like it would need to walk upright on land or to walk on all fours on land. The thing lives in the ocean. It doesn't need to support its weight on land. It doesn't even crawl up onto land. Why is that still there? Because it's left over from when this ancient creature, when its ancient relatives did live on land. Remember I told you they were small dog-like looking things. Eventually they transitioned into full aquatic life. Okay, uh, let's look at the human here. There's a number of things on humans. We could go on and on. Um, one is our tailbone. Humans are technically primates. That's what you are. You're a primate. Many primates have tails. Humans don't have tails. But we still have a bone for one in our butt. Anybody ever broken their tailbone? Hurts really bad if you break your tailbone. It really does hurt bad. I broke mine before. Um, why is that thing there? It, it is, it's not helping me walk. It's not helping my butt out. It's not helping anything out. It's a pain if you break it. It's there because if you go back far enough, there's an ancestor that had a tail. You have to go back pretty far. Okay. In fact, some people are actually born with little nub tails. Little tiny little nubs. They cut them off after birthday. Like they don't. Most people don't really want a little Smurf tail. But yeah, like a tiny little nub, right? So uh, that is still there. It's a vestigial structure. We've got other ones too, other real weird ones. Uh, for instance, do you notice that, have you ever got goosebumps before? Like the shiver, right? So it happens sometimes if people get scared or if they get cold, their skin bumps up like that. It's a weird thing. So what that's dating back to is when your relatives, ancient relatives, had a bunch of hair. If you get cold and those little hair follicles stand up, it fluffs your fur. And it provides warmth because dead air space is between the fur. Lots of other mammals have that characteristic and can do that. Can anybody wiggle their ears? Just a little bit? You can't wiggle them very much, but that muscle there that allows you to wiggle your ears that some of us can do, dates back to organisms that you're related to that could tweak and move their ears around, which is a really useful thing. Think about a cat. You're not closely related to a cat, but think about how they can tweak their ears around to hear sounds that are coming from different directions. It would not be a very useful thing for you. Right? You, wouldn't, you don't really need to do that. Um, 
How about your appendix, which is a little bit debatable? You can cut it out, right? Sometimes it goes bad and you gotta cut it out. There's a pretty good case for assuming that the appendix is a vestigial organ that used to aid in digestion when our ancient ancestors ate stuff like hard roots and uncooked meat and stuff like that. Now, unless you're eating hard roots and uncooked meat, your appendix doesn't serve a function. In fact, it's not really function that functional in a lot of us. Okay, it does still produce some enzymes and things like that, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of vestigial characteristics, which are really kind of neat, but they show you an ancient origin of something. Okay, um, they're, they're leftovers. Let's look at embryology. This is, this is a pretty cool one. Can you guys tell which embryo here is a human? The one on the left? Which one do you think? Definitely not this one in the middle. Like, look at the snout on that thing. That definitely doesn't look right. Okay. If I push this back even further, you wouldn't be able to tell at all. Like, I let it go a little bit, a little bit older. If we look at these, this is what you're looking at. This is a fish, this is a reptile, this is a bird, and this is a human on the right over here. So if you pick the one on the right, you were correct. Look at how similar these are. I know there's some differences, but I wanted them to look different enough that you could tell there is some difference. Look at how similar they are. Why are they so similar? Because all of these creatures are vertebrates. Every one of these guys up here has a backbone. Every one of them shares a common origin. Now don't get confused. Don't think that humans came from birds. Okay, you didn't. Don't think that birds came from fish. They didn't. But there is a common ancestor back far enough that had these characteristics that got passed forward. And the weird thing is if you look at it, every one of these embryos up here has a tail. Check it out. You definitely had a tail as an embryo. Like, like tell me that is not a tail. Just like the fish had a tail as an embryo. Okay, you had pharyngeal pouches, okay, those transition into different things. In the fish, those pouches become gill supports. In the other organisms like us, they become parts of our ears, jaws, and throat. So sometimes pieces that are important in one creature become adapted and transition into different things in another creature. It's very common in evolutionary change, kind of repurposing something that's already there. Um, but the question really might be, why is it that, say, a crocodile and a bird and a fish can look so different from a human, but yet look so similar to it as an embryo? Here's the reason. Remember back to our talk on what evolutionary change acts on? When they're in the egg or inside mom, is there much evolutionary pressure? No. Once they exit, then suddenly the external environment is selecting. But inside mom or inside the egg, they're contained. So we wouldn't expect for much change to have occurred when there's no outside pressures as to like survival, right? So that's why vertebrates all have a very similar embryology. Okay. Now, we also all have a common genetic code. If there wasn't a smoking gun in all of this, I, I mean, this has got to be it. We've studied DNA quite a bit, okay? Recognize this fact, that the central dogma of biology, right? DNA to RNA, right? Uh, or sorry, DNA to messenger RNA to, to, the, to the ribosome, right? To, tra to translation into a protein. That central methodology is common amongst everything that's living. So if life had evolved multiple times on our planet, there ought to be some different mechanisms, but it's all the same. Everything down to the smallest worm up to you uses exactly the same method to read the code, uses exactly the same four bases in its code. So much so that we can genetically engineer, we can hack the code. We can take code out of one critter, stick it in another critter, and make it make proteins that shouldn't be there. That's how closely related all life on our planet is. All the way down to the simplest little bacteria, all the way up to us, okay? So we can actually look, and this is scientists do this now, 
not just at homologous characteristics in the visible creature like bone structure, we look for genes that are homologous. And we say things like, okay, which genes do we share honestly with a fish? And how much have those genes changed over time and where have they changed? And we can pinpoint that stuff. Turns out there's loads of homologous genes. There's genes that we can trace in a fruit fly that we can also trace into a human. Because there's a relationship if you go back far enough. And don't get confused and think that humans came from fruit flies or the other way around. That ain't so, okay? But we do share a common ancestor someplace far enough back. In that central dogma of DNA, DNA to RNA to protein to trait, every single critter. It's why we can genetically engineer, right? So knowing this information, scientists went and created a genetic tree. They compared genes of all the species alive on Earth and said, how are they really related? Like, what is closely related to what? And we came up with something like this. And you've heard of some of these groups already. These are domains up here at the top. Remember, we did the domains, the kingdoms, the phylum, the class, all those things, right? So this common ancestry traces back to what we call a last universal common ancestor. I don't want to get too complex with it, but if you follow that little black line at the bottom there, there's something that's related to everything at the very bottom of this tree. The closer two points on this thing are, the more closely related they are. We've already talked about this a little bit early on in the year. So uh, if you look here, the bacteria are all in bluish here, okay? The Archaeans are in red. The eukaryotes are over here in kind of a brown color. We're a eukaryote. Eukaryotes are more closely related to the Archaeans than they are to the bacteria. That was a surprise. And not that most people probably care. Animals are also more closely related to fungi than they are to anything else up here. Isn't that weird? So tracing these relationships allows us to see kind of where things fit on the tree. We could, we could, of course, zoom in on that and see some area much more closely. But the point is, is that all life on our planet, both living, both extinct, both what's going to also what's going to come in the future is going to share a common ancestry and we can trace characteristics this way like we can ask ourselves you know when when did teeth enamel develop and we can trace this back into the fossil record and find the group of creatures where enamel developed on teeth you know, where did skulls change where did feathers develop and we can trace that forward into time See the bird there? See what's back beneath the bird a little ways? Did you know this? Birds are related to dinosaurs. Some of you might know this. Like, and I don't mean that like poetically. I mean literally, birds are the descendants of the dinosaurs. In fact, today when we classify birds, we put birds in the clade dinosauria. That's their clade. They are technically descendants of the dinosaurs. That's kind of cool that we can figure that stuff out. In fact, we've gone so far now that we've even discovered that things like T-Rex actually had feathers. Feathers don't preserve well in the fossil record, but we finally have discovered some feathers on a juvenile T-Rex. How long did they last into adulthood? Is every picture you've ever seen of T-Rex wrong? Quite possibly. Maybe it was covered in feathers. Maybe it lost them as it got older but it definitely had feathers. Some wild stuff, right? It really is, some neat stuff. There's the turtles there. We don't really know where they fit in exactly. So another piece of this puzzle, which is really kind of, I don't know, poignant today, especially in terms of coronavirus, is the ability of some of our pathogens like viruses and bacteria to evade all of our defenses through evolution. And it's scary, okay? This is an example of bacterial evolution, but you could easily apply this to the coronavirus because we're watching it real time do this. Okay, and if you don't know that, turn on the news for a minute and you'll see it. Actually, probably don't, it's really disturbing. So, bacteria, okay? 
you might have heard of something called an antibiotic resistant bacteria. If you haven't heard that, have you heard of MRSA? Okay, that's a resistant bacteria. This stuff is really dangerous. I know, I know it for a fact, my sister got this when she was little. When we were in high school, my sister got this and I thought she was being the biggest wimp of all time, right? She cut herself shaving her leg and there's a little tiny little pimple looking thing on her leg. And she was like in bed for a couple of days. She was like really sick and I was like, mom, you know, what's the deal with my sister? What, she's like totally a wimp, like she cut herself shaving and now she's like bedridden. You know, I thought like, what's the big deal, right? I didn't really know, I didn't understand that antibiotic resistance is a very dangerous thing. She got some bacteria in that cut that was resistant, resistant to every known antibiotic that we have. So we couldn't kill it. She couldn't put anything on it to kill it and it was eating her. She ended up in the hospital on an IV. She almost died. Like I, I had no idea, I just didn't even understand. I was like, I couldn't comprehend that a little cut on your leg could be that dangerous. Now, how does that happen? How did that develop? What occurred is that humans misuse antibiotics. If your doctor gives you a course of antibiotics and you start taking them, and at some point you're like, oh, I feel better, I really don't need these anymore because they're making my stomach upset, and you stop, and you don't finish the course of antibiotics. If there were bacteria in there that you're trying to kill off that you haven't killed off because they're a little bit more resistant because of their genetics, the variation that's already there, they survive and reproduce and suddenly you find yourself sick again. And you go back to your doctor and you're like, what gives, you know, I'm sick again. And she goes, well, did you finish course of antibiotics? And you're like, well, no. She's like, well, you just probably evolved a superbug. And now we have to give you a newer, stronger, even different antibiotic to try and take care of it. Well, there's some bacteria that have developed complete resistance to every single known antibiotic that we have. And that's really dangerous. Like you've probably heard of antibiotic resistant staph infection or MRSA, like things like that. It's really dangerous. It's like dark age is dangerous before we had antibiotics. So evolution does take place in real time in front of our very eyes. Okay. Uh, it's specifically, especially with things like bacteria and viruses that can replicate or reproduce really fast. So you see the genetic change happen fast. Did that, does one of those bacteria look different? I know they've got blue and red. Would it look different under a microscope? No, but the chemical differences inside of it allow one of those bacteria groups to kill you and the other one that you can just take some penicillin and take care of. Like, there's a real difference. It doesn't have to look different on the outside. Now we have also seen rapid evolutionary change in some larger creatures. Now you've got to look close to really see it. But this is kind of a famous study that uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant from Princeton, Univ Princeton University did. They spent 35 years studying Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. So these finches came from the mainland and spread out onto the islands and then slowly changed over time to look very different. Well, they, on one particular island, uh, Daphne Major, they caught and tagged every single finch. So they were all the same species. They didn't look different to begin with. Um, and they watched these birds for 35 years. And what happened was over the course of that time, there was a drought, okay? And the seeds changed. The seeds that these birds ate changed. And the seeds got tougher and harder after the drought. And it was a thing that persisted for years after this, the plants themselves were producing a tougher seed. And the beak size and shape actually shifted and changed after this occurred. And they saw it real time, which was really cool. I know in the picture it doesn't look like there's much of a difference, but they were very carefully measuring average beak depth um, through time and look at this, the, the change in what the average was. It shifted dramatically. We're gonna look at some of these later on, some of these graphs. This is like your hand graph where there was variation already there the new variation shifted and the beak depth increased. So uh, we do see this happen in real time, right? Sometimes it's dramatic, sometimes it's not so much so. Okay, everybody should have been answered, able to answer the quiz.